I guess you must all be excited about silver um, if you took the time out uh, on a day like this. So I, hopefully I'm going to make the case for silver. And uh, I'm going to talk about, of course, silver. I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, economic environment, but I'm also going to talk about where I think we are in terms of transitions. I think that we're in a, um, what you'd call, I'd call a, a, a challenging period in terms of transitions. So we've seen these before in multiple uh, asset classes, uh, but I think it's always good to step back and see exactly where we stand to understand um, what the outlook is and, uh, and to decide if, uh, if we're in the right place at the right time. So let's get started. Uh, it's no secret, inflation is high. I've been talking about this for some time. I think it's going to be the defining feature of uh, the investment landscape, probably at least until the end of this decade. So this chart shows you inflation rates in the U.S. from uh, for the last 20 years. What you can see is uh, the last 10 years or so, um, it pretty much flatlined right around 2%, um, which is uh, what the Fed says it wants, ultimately. And then it exploded. And so the effects are, are major. If you look at what that has done in the U.S., for example, right now you're looking at 157 million um, Americans. That's 61% of the adult population is now living paycheck to paycheck. So the effects really are pretty dramatic. This chart shows you um, three uh, markers for, uh, for rates. The black line is the, uh, is the interest rate. The red line is the inflation rate. And then the blue line is uh, real rates. And so that reflects the gap, essentially, between inflation and interest rates. So of course, you can see the blue line is, is negative, quite negative. The inflation rate is quite high, around 8 9%. And of course, interest rates are climbing. That's thanks to central banks raising rates. But the gap is, is wide, um, ultimately, uh, in order to get control of inflation, central banks should be technically raising rates to about the rate of inflation. Um, of course, you can have inflation come down, especially if they try to talk tough and get people to change their outlook. And so you could have that red line trending down and the black line trending up and that they would they close the gap. Uh, but if you look at the kinds of debt levels that we're looking at, just in the U.S., for example, $30 trillion of official debt, $170 trillion of unfunded liabilities, for central banks to be able to raise rates enough to close that gap substantially are next to none. And so although real rates are rising right now, getting closer uh, or trending back towards zero, I certainly expect that uh, perhaps a couple rate hikes more um, and then the Fed and other central banks are going to be very much limited. Uh, they can't raise rates too much. If they do, it makes, um, it makes paying back these debts next to impossible. We've seen what's happened with mortgages, how it's caused uh, the real estate industry to slow down pretty dramatically, pretty quickly. And so if they raise rates too much, as I say, with large outstanding national debts, um, it won't take long for not only for a slowdown, which affects... Um, tax collection, for example, uh, it also affects the, uh, the ability to pay interest on debt because you're paying a much higher rate. And so you end up just simply printing to, to make your interest payments. So really there are limits to all of this, but uh, let's move on and look at a couple of other points. Short yields are now above long yields. So the two-year uh, treasury in the U.S. actually pays more than the 30-year 30 uh, 30-year treasury. So that means you lend your money to the U.S. government for two years and get paid more than someone lending their money to the government for 30 years, which is crazy. It doesn't happen often. It doesn't usually last for very long, but it's very much indicative of, uh, of recessions or slowdowns. So as I say, the yield curve is inverted. Jobs, we've seen that growth is slowing. We, we are living through an oil price shock right now. The old oil price, in fact, in the last three months has started to trend down. So let's look at these individually. In the last 30 years, uh, every time you had a yield inversion in the uh, yield curve, it was uh, a precursor to the end of rate hikes. That happened each and every time. You could have a longer time lag perhaps this time, but it's very likely to indicate um, that we're, we're nearing the end, at least likely nearing the end of, of central bank rate hikes. 
So the chart on the left is the employment rate, the straight employment rate. And so it looks good in the sense that we've regained employment levels prior to the pandemic. But if you look at the chart on the right, that is employment to population ratio. That doesn't look so good. So that's the number of people employed over the total number of people in the population. This is in the US and that has not regained pre-pandemic levels and is still low and is actually trending slightly downward still after the, uh, the bounce, in fact. And so that points to things like uh, lower tax um, collection from uh, employed people. That hurts the budget. It uh, causes bar larger deficits in the, uh, in the national budget. And so again, pointing to, uh, to more money printing and likely again, uh, more inflation makes, you know, the Fed can talk a lot about raising rates. It can actually raise rates, but it certainly knows that its hands are tied uh, at, a, at a point. And that point is very far below current levels of inflation around 8%. I'm gonna say probably closer to maybe four, four and a half would be an ultimate peak. Now, this is an interesting chart. You look at what happens, the yellow, sorry, the white line is, is inflation in the 1970s. And so you clearly had three waves when inflation rose, dialed back, rose again, and did that three times over. The first one was in the late 60s, early 70s. And so it's interesting to see what it does to employment. The red line is the employment rate. And with a time lag, employ unemployment starts to go up after you have a wave of inflation. So we've arguably had our first big wave of inflation. It might, it might level off, it might even dial back a little bit, but it's more than likely to start affecting employment levels. And we're actually starting to see that, as I say in the chart I showed you before, we haven't regained prior levels in employment. And uh, this is likely to go on in waves, uh, probably at least for the next decade, possibly even longer. We, uh, given uh, the, the, the lack of uh, fiscal uh, management, um, it would not surprise me that goes on much longer. I talked about oil prices. The last three months we've seen um, oil prices correct and these kinds of uh, actions are again indicative of, of a slowdown in the economy. So I say transitions are messy. What I mean is that when you have a big trend change in, in any asset class, a multi-year secular trend change, uh, that period when you have the trend change tends to be messy. It's not obvious at first. It's obviously quite obvious in hindsight, which is, which is clear, but we don't have that luxury. Uh, we have to look at what the indicators are, what the market's telling us, and uh, look, at all of the, uh, look at all of the indicators. So let's look at a few of these. Um, in the early 1980s, we had the start of a secular bond bull. It was very difficult, perhaps, for most to realize that at the time. But in about June of 1980, the 10-year uh, the Treasury in the U.S. Had a, had a yield of 15%. So you could lend your money to the U.S. government at 15% per year for 10 years. So in that yellow oval, what happened next is the messy part. So if you were lucky enough or smart enough to buy at the peak, getting 15% yields, not only did you get 15%, but over the next year, your bonds went up 30% in value. And then it switched. The, the, um, the yields on those bonds, those bonds got sold off. The market uh, handled it the way that it did. The yields on those bonds uh, sp spiked again, back to about 12 and 13%, and you lost half of the gains that you had made in that first year. But if you held on, you actually had about 40 years. So that's, that, that's a historical uh, secular bull market in bonds. And that's thanks very much to uh, central banks keeping rates low. But you had a 40 year bull market in bonds where you, were, you, you had very attractive coupons uh, being paid, uh, interest being paid on your bond. And you had rising uh, capital gains on the bond. So it was a tremendous bull market to, take, uh, to, to participate in. The problem was realizing it and holding on because as I say, that two year period was messy and it was tough for a lot of people. The bull sh shook a lot of people off. Around the same time, you had the start of a secular stock bull market. So this would have been from about November of 1980 until of about November of 19, uh, 1982. 
So as you can see at the very left of that uh, oval, you had a run up in stocks that took over, uh, that was about a six month period. And over the next sort of nine months to a year, you had a sell off again. And yet that period was the transition. That's when stocks started a brand new bull market. It didn't hurt that, that interest rates started falling. That of course encouraged uh, business and borrowing. So that helped kick off, uh, um, again, you could argue a 40 year bull market in stocks, a historically long bull market. So now if we turn to precious metals, Around the 2000 to 2002, or let's say 1999 to 2001 period, you had a similar messy period, a transition again to a start of a precious metals bull market. So from about late 1999 until about 2001, when some people saw the dot-com peak and figured there's a switch, now we're gonna move into a new era where bonds and stocks have had their run and it's the time now for precious metals. Um, people, some people got into precious metals and if they were able to hold on long enough, they rode a fantastic bull market for at least arguably a decade before you had a, what I call a mid-secular bull a correction. But again, that, that messy transition period was hard to hang on. Um, and yet it was very lucrative if you were able to uh, assess where we were, partake in it, and then again, as I say, hang on. If we look back over the last 22 years, since 2000, silver and gold have handily beat stocks. The S&P is up about 180%, silver is up about 250%, and gold is up over 500%. So if you ask the average investor, where is the best place been to be um, in the last, say, 20, 22 years, you almost invariably are gonna hear stocks, and yet that is not the case at all today. So uh, I still, as I say, very much believe, despite the corrections we've been through, we're, we are in a, a long-term secular bull market for precious metals. Silver in particular outperforms gold. The first three of these, uh, of these charts or uh, portions of these charts show uh, uh, bull cycles for precious metals. And as you can see, the, bull, the blue line uh, runs up above, especially in the latter part, it runs up above the yellow line. So silver, as I say, proves itself time and time again to outperform gold in bull markets, in precious metals bull markets. So um, we have yet to see that this time around, um, but that certainly bodes well for the, the potential for silver. It's just interesting to see how the gold-silver ratio correlates with the US dollar, the US dollar index. And so over time, as you can see, it follows it very closely. So that's a bit of a, um, a, bit of, a uh, of a headwind for silver because as the gold-silver ratio moves up, that means gold is outperforming silver. That doesn't mean silver is going down. It's always relative. They could both be going up, but that gold is perhaps rising more quickly. But with the, the US dollar index now near 109, 110, and who knows, perhaps running to 115, 120, it's impossible to say. But uh, with the Fed continuously raising rates and the outlook is uh, still, as I say, for a couple of more rate hikes, chances are that at the very least, the ratio is gonna stay elevated and that could act as a headwind for silver. If we look at silver uh, before, during, and around recessions. So the, f the top part of this chart is silver and the bottom part is gold. So as you can see on the left side, you see a lot of red. So that means both metals tend to struggle before recessions. That middle section, that narrow section, is how they react during recessions. And so you can see that uh, silver struggles more than gold does during recessions. But then the, the right part is post-recession. And so you see a lot more green because that means that silver tends to outperform during uh, the periods that, especially the 12 months that when you come out of recession, and that intuitively makes sense because silver has the industrial component to it. So this you can take as you, as you wish. Um, I'm not gonna go into, into too much detail, but it's clear that inventories on the COMEX and on the London uh, exchange um, have been falling, especially since say the middle or so of last year. Uh, and we've seen six to nine months of continuous drawdown. So uh, someone wants to take physical possession of that silver for whatever reason. 
I like to say that silver is sticky money. So this chart shows the, the sort of grayish pink portion, the gray, uh, that colored area at the bottom, shows silver, physical silver inventories in ETFs, silver ETFs globally. And so the first thing to notice is that since the first silver ETF in 2006, on balance, this has almost only either grown or moved sideways. And laid over that is the squiggly line in purple is the silver price. So the silver price is obviously quite volatile, goes through run-ups and then corrections and then moves sideways and then goes through more run-ups. But, and those are the blue periods when you have corrections in the silver price, those blue bars. So those black arrows that I've overlaid over that shows is to try and point out that despite the fact that you've had either large or still notable corrections in the silver price, you still have silver inventories during those considerable or medium corrections in the silver price, you still have silver inventories in ETFs either move sideways mainly or even actually increase. So people tend to buy silver and hold on to it again on balance. So now let's turn our attention a little bit to the solar industry because it's so crucial to uh, silver demand. Between 2013 and 2021, solar demand grew 125% for silver. In 2021, it was up 13%, and this year it's expected to grow another 12%. So the green bars are the growth in, uh, in um, demand for silver from the solar industry. The orange line across that is the amount of silver that goes into each solar panel. That, of course, has been leveling off. But if you look at the expected um, upcoming technologies for solar panels, it's likely that the, the next technology will use about 50% more per panel, and the one to follow on that could use as much as 150% more silver per panel. And there are all sorts of developments coming um, in China that dominates the, the solar panel industry. They've got things like double-sided solar panels, which would naturally likely double the amount of silver required for each panel. So there are all kinds of things in the pipeline that uh, suggest that the, the solar industry is really going to uh, uh, help keep very much, uh, very much robust demand for silver. This shows, if you look at the bottom bars, these are the medium blue are the photographer, I'd like to kind of point out the, the, uh, the, the juxtaposition, if you want, between the, the demand for silver from the photography side and then uh, how that's been leveling off and, and dropping, but how the, uh, the rise in demand from solar has actually been increasing and outpacing photography. So I'm gonna move on a little more quickly because I see that my time is running low. Silver's got its challenges. We talked about recession, uh, especially if there's a slowdown uh, and industrial demand could certainly uh, perhaps be affected. The strong dollar, strong bond yields as bonds become, especially with higher yields, an alternative and attractive asset, perhaps instead uh, for some investors for silver. And I talked about the transition. But the outlook, I think, remains bullish. I think that inflation on balance is likely to remain high. The dollar will certainly peak at some point. Uh, it's tough on multinationals, American multinationals that sell around the world, especially when their products are more expensive based on uh, the exchange. I think industrial demand will remain supportive, and I think at some point investment demand will kick in. I say inflation is going to remain high because when you look at the, um, the uh, energy crisis, especially in Europe right now, some people are facing electricity bills are 10 times above the levels they had last year. Europe is talking about committing as much as uh, close to $400 billion over the next few years to help cap uh, people's electricity bills. Britain has said over the next two years it would cap electricity bills. That's likely to cost them over $100 billion. And then you've got things like the U.S. student loan bailouts program that's going to cost, apparently according to the Congressional Budget Office, as much as $330 billion over the next 10 years. And then you have what I put in quotes, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that's going to be a lot of money invested in production, energy production, supposed to reduce carbon emissions by about 40% over 10 years. And then uh, about $370 billion will go to renewables and to new climate measures. But the implications for solar are huge. Uh, there was a study by Princeton, Dartmouth, and a couple of other research groups that together looked at the effects of the Inflation Reduction Act. 
And they said that in 1920, uh, sorry, in 2020, you had 10 gigawatts of new installation of uh, solar per year. They expect that by 2024, so just two years out, that could be five times that level. By 2030, it could be 10 times the 2020 level. And so the, re the act is supposed to uh, shovel about $320 billion towards solar alone. That would double the current growth levels. And they've actually renewed, uh, they've, they've extended um, the solar investment tax credit. So it's really a lot of support and push for solar. This is why we've been facing deficits in the silver, uh, on the silver supply side. There was about a 50 million ounce deficit in 2021. We're expecting about a 70 million ounce deficit this year. And the Silver Institute expects deficits for years uh, on end. If you look at the miners um, switching gears, uh, they've been, the larger miners have been very much uh, happy with their free cash flow. On balance, gold and silver have, are, are above, considerably above levels that they were at a few years ago. Um, and if specifically, if you look at the gold side, uh, they've had big budget, they've been spending on exploration, but the lack of discoveries uh, is, is obvious. If you look at those bars at the bottom um, on the right side, uh, there have been no major discoveries on the gold side. Silver miners are not spending on CapEx. Um, that means on their, in, their current uh, production to expand and to renew things, as well as on the exploration side. So it certainly looks like, um, especially on the silver side, they've downloaded that effort to the juniors. And so one of the threats to silver supply is that uh, only about 30%, under 30% comes from primary silver mining as much as 70% comes from mining other metals like gold, copper, lead, and zinc. And so if you, have a, if you do have a slowdown and you do have some uh, pullback in the production of some of these base metals, that's almost certainly going to affect the silver supply and exacerbate things. If you look at silver versus commodities over the last couple of years, commodities have exploded higher. Silver has not kept up. It would need to double its current price just to get the kinds of returns you've had in the last two years in commodities overall. Um, the outlook near term actually could be quite bullish uh, the next several months. You've got uh, um, a, a very atypical situation with, uh, uh, with hedgers, um, the smart money hedgers being the, um, uh, the companies like uh, the large producers and so on that have uh, bullish uh, bets right now. They're net long in silver futures. That really does not happen very often, so that means they really don't see very much downside at all in silver price. And so the opportunity in silver is physical silver or silver stocks. Um, physical silver right now, unfortunately, especially the coins and the, some of the bars are, have really high premiums. And given what's been happening in the lack of spending by, the, by a lot of the majors, I really see a lot of opportunity in the explorers. Uh, they are highly undervalued, especially in the last six months. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to look at the silver price, which we tend to do in, in U.S. dollars, but if you look at the silver price in a basket of major currencies around the world, that's that blue line. It has easily surpassed, especially in the last sort of eight to ten years, uh, what it's done in the U.S. dollar. So that's what a lot of people around the world are seeing in terms of silver price. So it has not been as depressed as perhaps a lot of us tend to think. Um, very quickly, some forecasts in terms of the silver price. A guy you may know, Rick Rule, thinks in the next five years we'll see silver north of 50. Keith Neumeyer of uh, First Majestic thinks we're going to see triple digit this uh, bull market. Citigroup sees $40 in a year, $50 to $100 in the coming years. Gehring and Rosenzweig sees as much as $500 this decade. Great guy presenting here, Chen Lin, sees silver as the next lithium. Um, he says that if you sell at $30 or $40, you're going to regret it. And an obscure, lesser-known analyst, Peter Kraut, thinks we're going to see $300, this bull market. So take that for what it's worth. Um, to wrap up, remember, silver is crucial to the green revolution. I talked only about solar, but you've got electronics. You've got all sorts of other aspects where silver is irreplaceable. It's an inflationary asset. It's proven itself over decades and centuries to prove to uh, purchase um, to protect your purchasing power. It's a money. It's been money for thousands of years, and it certainly is historically undervalued. You can read about all of this in my book, The Great Silver Bull, that I published about uh, four months ago. It's available in paperback and in Kindle. And if you want to know more. Uh, just go to silverstockinvestor.com and uh, you can follow what I'm doing and uh, you can subscribe to my newsletter.
Thank you very much.